um, and there's so much happening um, and since the morning because we, I think we set out the uh, tone on this uh, real debate in a constructive way on why different uh, tools or techniques were working or not working starting with the peer educators' education. And I think, uh, uh, I, I was in two, uh, obviously we couldn't be in all, uh, workshops, um, uh, groups, and uh, one of the main, uh, I think, uh, takeaway was that the, the principle, the guiding principle has been the same across uh, countries and uh, context. A is that you have very good faith that if you have a design that is uh, pro uh, uh, adolescents and young people and if you have the design to listen to what they need and demand and you, re you kind of rearrange yourself accordingly, it shows a lot of success. So uh, I think uh, uh, that, that has been uh, one of the most important points that I've seen and also how counseling interestingly and different forms of uh, having a forum where young people can come and talk to different techniques are making way which means that if we uh, tweak it around mental health emotional well-being uh, can be more formally addressed in uh, existing programs which is very promising because as we've seen mental health and these have been a big issue and gap uh, uh, two things that bears at the face in terms of missing things. One is that uh, uh, this today was a day of practitioners, from design to implementing ones. And somehow, uh, if uh, we could make sure that donors were present in like each and every session, uh, then it would have been really, really good because we need to speak to someone who finances this and to hear from first person narrative what are the difficulties and struggles and what uh, constraints uh, within which uh, everybody works around. Uh, so I think the struggles we all understand because we all go through it in one format or the other, but people who, uh, you know, who are in the position of power and on the top of the hierarchy, and there is one, uh, uh, I think uh, need to be more present and uh, more, more interactive in terms of getting to know how, what they want is difficult and you know hard earned in terms of implementing these programs. And the second one is um, something um, uh, that has been in my mind and it has been kind of uh, I, I kind of sensed it. It's so much of uh, um, uh, I think criticism, uh, good bad goes into service providers and how much uh, they cannot deliver or we cannot deliver. This is the uh, limitation. This is the failure. But what we do not uh, recognize is the uh, burden that each one actually carries because this is one field that is not the happiest of all. You don't get to see very happy faces all the time. This is a field where all your service centers are full of people's troubles. And when you are that one or two person who has to listen to it, there is very little uh, provision or even a dialogue on, on self-care of the service providers. Where do they go? when things get really rough and you are overburdened and overloaded with all these demands of daily work this, daily work that, you have to be friendly, you have to be patient, you have to be super non-judgmental and you have zero salary, okay, go home. It, and we've seen crash and burn of, of uh, service providers, especially at the um, grassroots level and we never, we rarely have any system that cares for them. And, and we cannot expect to have great delivery, effective, impactful delivery, if we do not find a mechanism to take care of that. Because it cannot be a one-way traffic. So this is the, uh, you know, youth-friendly service is not only youth-friendly, it has to be also the service providers friendly. There was a great session run by Frank and Rirsha on performance-based financing. And uh, the message I took away from that is they had a, one slide with a map of African countries with um, performance-based financing programs a few years ago, and another, another map showing how many of these countries have these programs now. And that's very, very impressive. In the morning I was talking about how we abuse training as the one method to try to improve um, the quality of health service provision. And what we could see very clearly 
is that this is a powerful mechanism. Money on its own is not enough, but what they've uh, tied in with the money is the governance of the system. So to address the system's issues, but also put in place standard operating procedures, checks and balances. So clearly something to develop and something to go. Um, the third point was a discussion over lunch. And thank you to the organizers for a very nice lunch. We had a chat with Douglas and Rina uh, about um, collaborating with PSI and learning from PSI's work. And Douglas, who's not here now, was talking about one of their things about trying to shorten the learning loop. Traditional model is you design a program, you put it in place, and you evaluate it internally or externally three years down the road, and then you get your learning. And so what they're trying to do is to put in place learning which happens in real time. So you can put in place a program and then use monitoring data, which is digitally based to say, you know, who are coming into the clinic and who are not, and what could we do about why they're coming or why they're not coming. And so this is very exciting, you know, to learn these. So these are my three messages. A whole wonderful afternoon today. Thank you. That we need to, kind of, we, we talk a lot in this field, and now it's starting. We really need to implement, and we need to act. And I agree with that completely. But I also think that we need to keep talking. Not just talking to ourselves, though. Really reaching out to other sectors, to other disciplines, to um, our country teams on the ground, the people, our foot soldiers who are implementing the work. And make sure that everything that gets discussed around best practices and what works and what doesn't gets to those foot soldiers on the ground. Because I think often we have these amazing fora here and sometimes it just stays here. So we need to keep the conversation going, keep that learning going, and really start to tackle the tough questions and the tough issues that come up. The peer education debate being a great one. We need to keep talking about this and dissecting this together. We need to invest meaningfully in young people and in youth engagement, right? We've talked a lot today. There are so many um, examples of how we um, are, how programs are investing in young people. We need to continue to do that and put real resources behind that, um, that engagement. The importance of accountability, right? Accountability of health providers to their clients, the accountability of governments and policymakers to their people, the, and it, back to us, the accountability that we have to our folks, our foot soldier, soldiers in the field to make sure that these best practices get there. A lot of today was really focused on service delivery, but I don't want to forget the incredible importance of behavior change communication and demand creation for services and really that whole enabling environment, the social norms and policies and practices that will allow service delivery to happen effectively. We can't have a conversation about service delivery over here and not talk about all of those other factors um, that make an effective health system work, which include the supply side, the demand side, the enabling environment. And lastly, just to come back to working across disciplines, again, I'm starting to say this a lot in the fora I speak in, that we really need to stop just talking to ourselves as public health, sexual and reproductive health professionals. We do talk to ourselves a lot, and that's really good, and we should be, but, and we also just partner with ourselves a lot. And so something that we're, we're doing at PSI um, is really reaching across disciplines and across sectors to engage fresh minds and different ways of thinking in the way that we that we implement adolescent sexual and reproductive health programs. So just a quick example, we, we have a big new investment from the Gates Foundation and the Children's Investment Fund Foundation called Adolescence 360. It's a $30 million project to increase contraceptive use among 15 to 19 year old girls in Nigeria, Ethiopia, and Tanzania. And our approach is to work with with the public health community and the social marketing community, as we always have done. But it also means bringing on human-centered design partners, adolescent brain researchers, cultural anthropologists, mobile technology providers, so really reaching out to other disciplines and, and trying to create novel, new approaches to designing programs 
that engage young people and engage these different ways of thinking. So hopefully we can do something different and really kind of break that, that frontier, that you know, into that frontier that I keep talking about. So anyway, all that to say, we have amazing challenges ahead of us. I think we sparked really good conversation today. I want to thank you again on behalf of PSI and PSI Europe, as well as Rutgers for being incredible collaborators, as always. Um, thank you, ShareNet, for giving us the opportunity to host this day.